Hello and welcome to the Think Big series brought to you by PSG. I'm Alicia Seckham. Well, with the US elections coming up in November, today we're going to be exploring the global economic ripple effect of the potential outcome in this Harris versus Trump scenario. US historian Alan Litchman, who has correctly predicted each election since 1984, recently announced his prediction for a Kamala Harris win in the upcoming US elections. But... Nobody can definitively rule out a Trump victory just yet, right? Larry Hathaway has over 25 years experience as an economist and multi-asset investment professional. He is co-founder of Jackson Hole Economics, which is a non-profit offering commentary and analysis on the global economy, matters of public policy and capital markets as well. And he joins us now to analyze the nuanced impacts of each candidate's policies on the global economy. Larry, thanks so much for joining us today. And I'm going to kick straight into gear, right? Because you're joining us from that end of the world. And so perhaps that's exactly where we need to start. Give us a sense of sentiment on the ground right now ahead of November the 5th as Americans prepare to head to the polls. Well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here, despite these challenging circumstances of a closely contested and, I must say, highly contentious election. And that last word really captures, I think, the, the sentiment here. I think the sentiment is, unfortunately, as divisive as it's often reported to be. Uh, two sort of opposing camps, ardent sort of fans of their respective candidates, and fearful, perhaps, in many cases, of a possible victory by their opponent. Um, and so from that perspective, it's something that, frankly, in my life, I've never really seen before. Perhaps in the last 10 years, we've seen echoes of this, but the intensification of that division is, is palatable. Uh, and so too are the concerns and what might one might, might call the angst that is out there. So uh, that's probably the easiest way to, to talk a little bit about the starting point of our discussion today. Well, sitting on this end of the world, the sense is that the uh, polarizations intensifying in this final stretch as well. But where there is Main Street and Wall Street to consider here, Larry, if we home in on the latter and that being market reaction, how are you expecting investors specifically to react to a Trump victory versus a Harris one? Because... Um, I read a comment from Larry Fink, co-founder of the world's largest asset manager, just the other day, saying that the outcome really doesn't matter, that he's tired of hearing this is the biggest election in your lifetime. The reality is that over time, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, so Larry has lots of company there. I think that is a very, very common refrain on Wall Street that people should not over, as it were, um, uh, exaggerate the importance of the election for their portfolios, for their investments, with the caveat that that's long term. And I think there's a lot of evidence for that particular argument in the very long run. Uh, markets perform uh, often well, uh, sometimes badly, and it doesn't really seem to matter who's in the White House, uh, who has control of Congress and so forth. So there is, I suppose, statistical validity for that. The concerns, however, that I have is that we may have a very close, very contested election potentially with lots of litigation, possibly even some uh, violence or at least some uh, sort of, let's say, non-normal behavior amongst the electric politicians and so forth, and that that uncertainty uh, could actually linger well into December. Uh, the vote has to be certified on the 16th of December. Um, and from that perspective, we know that, that uncertainty is typically the enemy of markets. So it would not surprise me if we saw some volatility in markets, particularly given how let's say well-behaved, actually quite, let's say rosy uh, market conditions have been uh, in the run-up to the election. Yeah, important to highlight a point that you just briefly touched on there, because while that's the sentiment, the reality is that there's a difference between, uh, you know, a candidate winning and also having control of Congress or a cooperative Congress for that matter, because it affects how much they can change the status quo, right? Yes, the president comes with... Um, some unilateral powers, but the U.S. political system is designed with checks and balances. And, you know, most significant policy changes have to pass through the two bodies of Congress, and that being the House of Representatives and the Senate. So talk us through that and how closely you're watching developments there, what you're anticipating in that regard. 
Yes, yeah, so, so uh, you've absolutely correctly delineated what is required legislatively, which is that legislation begins typically, by the way, in the House of Representatives, certainly has to pass both houses, that is the House as well as the Senate, and then be signed into law. And as a result, a divided government sometimes brings with it a certain degree of gridlock, a certain degree of stasis. Um, so if we then look at the outcomes of the, of the election, sort of the possible outcomes, it seems to me that two are really in play um, and that are perhaps of most interest to us. The first is that in the event that Donald Trump is uh, elected again as the president of the United States, there is a distinct chance. I would not say that it's uh, necessarily the base case, but certainly a distinct chance that he carries uh, both the Senate, that seems quite certain, but also the House with him so that you get unified government, a so-called clean sweep of Republicans. That's worth considering because as it means that much of that agenda, that economic agenda, that market-related agenda, would have significant chances of being enacted legislatively, giving obviously uh, more, more, let's say, credence to, to the Republican agenda. The second possible alternative is that Vice President Harris wins the election. And in that case, it's almost certain uh, that she will face divided government insofar as the Senate, with a high probability, looks like it's going to flip into, Republic, into a Republican majority, meaning that her legislative agenda is less likely to be passed through Congress easily, uh, if at all. And from that perspective, there really is a dichotomy of outcomes there. So as we get perhaps into those issues, we want to think about that. Final yeah. point here, if we do see a Trump presidency, but say the Democrats uh, get the majority in the House, that could change uh, some of the calculus around things like the extension of the 2017 tax cuts, uh, which is a big part of the Republican agenda. Uh, but it doesn't change some other outcomes. For example, the ability of the president unilaterally to impose tariffs, um, which I know is a big issue both within the, uh, the U.S. and outside of it. Yeah. In terms of that economic policy, so let's start drilling into some of the detail then, right? Spell it out for us. How will outcomes differ under a Trump versus Harris presidency? And you've alluded to uh, some of the changes we could be looking at. I mean, Trump's certainly been loud. Harris has been uh, perhaps a bit more vague on policy details, which speaks, I guess, to a continuity of sorts on, on that end, no? Right. So let's let's start first with the possibility of a Trump presidency. Um, most, I would say, indicators suggest that is the slight odds on favorite. Certainly when one look, looks at things like predict it, that is where people are willing to essentially put money on the outcome. Uh, Trump has somewhat of a lead there. And in the polls, it's much closer. But there certainly is this possibility, as we've seen before in that environment. And if we assume that there is this clean sweep, then most certainly we're going to get the extension of tax cuts that were passed in 2017 that at least in part expire. Per se, that doesn't affect the corporate income tax rate, but Donald Trump is on the record as wanting to see that lowered from 21% down to 15%, which certainly could be possible, uh, probably more likely, and I know this is a very domestic issue, but that we'll actually get some relief on state and local income tax deduction, the so-called SALT deductions may be restored in part or in full to where they had been in 2016. That's a popular item in many, in many states. But we can certainly bank on tax reduction. What we can't bank on in that environment is expenditure reduction or expenditure control. So the idea that a Trump administration under a clean sweep leads to a fairly interesting, over 10 years admittedly, but expansion of the U.S. federal government deficit and therefore to the stock of federal government debt is something we, we should reckon with. And while we'll come to market reactions later, perhaps in more detail, I would note that the bond market is vulnerable to that particular outcome. That is bond prices could fall, yields could rise in the event that they anticipate that. The second thing that's also likely in that Trump clean sweep is further measures to deregulate um, industries in the United States and the chief beneficiaries, and we'll talk market reactions also perhaps a bit later, but are likely to be uh, the traditional energy sector, that is uh, fossil fuels, uh, the pharma sector, which gets some relief from the possibility that could be more regulated under Harris administration and financial services. Those are sort of the three, let's say, big winners of, of measures either taken unilaterally by the president 
the executive order or legislatively with assistance from the Congress uh, to uh, to push that deregulation agenda. And lastly, yeah. uh, tariffs. Um, as I said before, tariffs are, don't require legislative approval. Um, and it is fairly clear, it seems to me, that tariffs, at least on Chinese-made goods, would go up. Trump has talked about using tariffs as a way to offset some of the tax reductions, that is to increase tax revenues from that source, um, which paradoxically, of course, is a tax on Americans, despite what he may say, it is definitely a tax on consumers. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that statement. Um, but in any event, uh, whether those tariffs would be more widespread remains to be seen. But recall back in his first administration, uh, Donald Trump uh, levied ta tariffs on uh, near partners, uh, Canada, um, parts of European production, uh, Mexican production, not just on China. So the idea that it could be pretty broad based is is not far fetched at all. There is history for that. Yeah. So with what you've just laid out, Larry, I mean, the one is, of course, more inflationary inducing than the other. Right. And the narrative so far has been that Trump's policies would see to a more hawkish Fed, while Harris's policies could result in a in a Fed that's more dovish. So how do you see each candidate's economic policies then influencing uh, the Federal Reserve's approach and consequently the U.S. dollar and global markets? Correct. So again, in that scenario, uh, you, you're absolutely right to follow that trail. Uh, the larger deficits, the stimulus provided for that would probably slow the Fed's approach to policy easing. I, I think the Fed will continue to ease, but it's also relative to what is expected. Uh, recently, of course, uh, markets have perhaps become a bit more cautious about Fed easing, but nevertheless. And from that perspective, one of the paradoxes of the uh, of the Trump policy is that it would probably lead to a stronger dollar simply because of the higher interest rate environment, perhaps a slightly uh, better growth environment, and certainly a higher return on capital, especially after tax return on capital environment that would invite capital flows from the rest of the world into the United States. Um, uh, Donald Trump's policies, to the extent that he wants a weaker dollar, in the past he's argued for that, are therefore internally inconsistent uh, nothing new there. That isn't uh, something that's alien to politicians. We see that all the time. But it is worth noting that if he pursues his tax cuts, that agenda, a larger deficit seems likely, uh, he's probably going to see a stronger dollar ensue from that, um, with which I doubt he'll be very pleased. But I'm sure it, uh, it, it won't fall on many people as, as wrong to say that it's a result of his policies and, and nothing else. As far as implications on the dollar, uh, like you say, you know, it's not only as a result of domestic policy, but then foreign and then trade policy specifically as well, where um, any escalating trade tension is likely to drive U.S. interest rates and the dollar higher, which would impact the global economy, particularly emerging markets like South Africa, right? Yeah, I mean, in some very long run sense, of course, um, cutting the world off from trade opportunities, deglobalization, whatever one might want to call it, is going to lower everyone's growth in the long run. Uh, again, there's not much disputing that. And therefore, in the long run, should lead to even lower interest rates as growth rates are more subdued in the deglobalized world. But in the time period that most of us are concerned about, looking out over the next, uh, say, year or two, uh, and, and some periods within that, the, the results are, are likely to be, as you just suggested, higher interest rates, stronger dollar. And um, it should be noted that for a lot of industries, this will be a difficult challenge for them. Uh, their input costs will go up. Yes, they'll probably push that along as much as they can, i.e. there may be some measured increase in inflation, but it's not genuine inflation. This is not sort of an enduring set of price increases. This is effectively a set of one-off price increases due to tariffs, which actually um, rob people of purchasing power uh, and lower economic growth. And as a consequence, uh, over time, it actually will lead to the some of the opposite outcomes, namely lower interest rates and maybe in the very long run, a weaker dollar. But none of that will matter much for investors. In that first year, it's more about rising interest rates and a stronger dollar. Yeah. I'm going to drill into the detail of trade policy in just a bit. Before I do, while ordinarily American voters focus primarily on domestic issues when choosing their president, to what extent have the wars in Ukraine, Gaza, now Lebanon influenced the campaign, you know, blurring that line between domestic and foreign policy, Larry, because some have gone as far as to label uh, the November 1st presidential election as a referendum on the United States role in the world. <laughs> 
Again, a, a really, really interesting question, valid point there. Um, we tend to think of voters, probably in most countries, as focusing on their domestic and especially pocketbook issues. But several of the ones that uh, you just raised and maybe another one can be thought of as really foreign policy issues. Um, I'll start with one of the biggest, which is immigration. Um, immigration is almost by, uh, by, uh, by almost self-evidently an international issue that is folks coming from abroad into your country and what to do about that. Uh, but also these others, the, the conflicts that, that we see. Um, they don't necessarily affect what I would call the broad electorate, but they affect important components of the electorate, components of the electorate that could be proved decisive in those so-called battleground or swing states that will determine the outcome of the presidential election and might even influence some of the other uh, election outcomes that we that we have before us. So, for example, uh, the war in uh, between Israel and Hamas has alienated many, many young people from the policies of the Biden administration and by extension has probably hurt Kamala Harris's chances with some of the more younger and more progressive voters uh, who are upset by what they have seen, as we all are, I'm sure, to some extent, by what we've seen in Gaza, West Bank and, and elsewhere. Um, the war in Ukraine, arguably less so. I, I, I mean, it is an issue, and you will see some prominent Republicans who are much more of the traditional Republican Party, such as Liz Cheney and her father, the former Vice President Dick Cheney, who are supporting Kamala Harris and doing so in part, um, maybe not entirely, but in part because of their views about um, things they grew up with, which is a Cold War, Russia is an adversary. Um, and respect for institutions like NATO. Um, all of those things matter a great deal to many traditional Republicans. So from that perspective, and it's too early to say, uh, Donald Hump, uh, Trump may be losing some support here uh, with what we might call more traditional Republicans, Reagan Republicans, who view those areas uh, with great concern and, and even some alarm. So uh, yes, foreign policy does matter here, not because again, it's the decisive broad matter for the electorate, but it could matter for, for some subgroups that could swing the outcome. Yeah, and foreign policy and trade agreements, you know, going hand in hand as well, you know, uh, with ramifications for global trade relations, uh, dynamic as well. Uh, so as far as that goes, and you can anticipate, of course, um, what are you expecting there? Because it will shape global alliances and economic partnerships. And perhaps I want to bring it to, um, you know, an emerging market like South Africa and how you see um, a market like ours sitting at this intersection. Right. So if we start with the emerging markets as, as markets, as capital market destinations for investment and for opportunity, um, we know that with you know the odd exception, perhaps India being the exception here, is that they are typically very tied to the global economy, to the fortunes of the global economy. Therefore, to things we've talked about, dollar and interest rates, uh, global growth. Uh, and it has been a difficult time for many emerging markets, uh, particularly equity markets, over the last decade or so, because we've seen a key driver of their fortunes, particularly those that are more commodity-based, slow it down, which is China, and in particular, its property sector. And uh, we have seen since 2017 the imposition of some tariffs and a general trend towards deglobalization. That is, trade as a share of world GDP peaked in the mid uh, in, in the middle part of that decade and has been gently declining since then. I leave aside aberrations due to the pandemic outside of that discussion. That has been the case. Um, and whilst much of that it relates to U.S.-China trade and trade also between Europe and China, uh, it is nevertheless something that should be of concern to emerging markets all over the world that are engaged in world trade and are also trying to attract capital from abroad because the two things are inherently linked to one another. So we do have, it must be said, without hopefully being too pessimistic, a very challenging environment for the emerging market outlook in a secular sense about this trend towards less, uh, let's say, robust support politically for globalization, but also the advent of some ways in which we're trying to circumvent globalization, uh, the various ways in which we're near and near shoring and maybe re-onshoring, particularly around some new technologies uh, that potentially could uh, stunt the development, the further development of some emerging markets via the traditional route of trade and finance. The traditional route.
if we flip the script a little bit here, I mean, is there opportunity, the diversification of supply chains outside of South Africa? Because we've already seen that start to happen. Uh, you know, it's been a trend that has been priced in to an extent, and you've got potentially, I don't know, emerging markets standing as beneficiaries if they're ready for it. There is. I mean, uh, again, perhaps I'll, I'll come to South Africa in a moment. I mean, what we have seen in the, let's say, deglobalization to some extent of China with respect to, say, global manufacturing is, yes, the transference of some of that uh, production to other countries, Vietnam, a beneficiary, uh, and Mexico, to some extent, a beneficiary. So two emerging markets that are perhaps uh, picking up pieces that are leaving China. And it may be that other countries uh, could follow that, that route. Um, but just to say, again, that that uh, that's not clear insofar as those may be candidates for tariffs, again, if, if Trump wins to bring it back to the U.S. elections. The, uh, the, it seems to me that the, that the key here for, for the emerging complex um, is actually um, a varied one. In other words, it really depends on who you are and where you are. Um, commodity producers may still have opportunities. We can think about, for example, Again, it is a secular theme, uh, global electrification, what that means for those who are producing the raw materials for that, just as one example, Chile and copper is, I suppose, what comes immediately to mind, but there may be others. Uh, there's a, a great build out of all forms of infrastructure, so more basic materials, raw materials producers can be, be part of that. In South Africa may find some opportunities there. There are, of course, um, fantastic technological breakthroughs, and there's no real reason why emerging markets can't be part of that story, too, depending, obviously, on skill sets and opportunities within them and their attitudes towards business. But clearly, India, in many respects, has been at the forefront of that now for several decades. So I wouldn't want to say that deglobalization and those factors, which may be enhanced in a Trump world, I, I think they almost uh, by definition will be, preclude all opportunities but I do think it's going to require some adaptability, nimbleness, and uh, and and some uh, degrees of flexibility to participate. Uh, the old way of doing things doesn't seem to be all that pro uh, promising, unfortunately. Absolutely. So all of that said then, Larry, which sectors are most likely to benefit from a Trump or a Harris victory and why? Right. So uh, because we've talked a lot about Trump victory, let's, let's entertain the possibility of a Harris <laughs> victory right first. Uh, so in a Harris I'm not sure if this should be indicative of your leaning here. <laughs> no, no, well, I hope not. I'm trying to be as impartial as possible, even if I perhaps have deep down my own preferences in this outcome. But uh, no, so in a, in a Harris victory, it seems to me that what you will get is uh, some continued support in, in, for sectors that have essentially been for lack of a better way of saying it, chosen via industrial policy to win. Uh, so alternative energy, right? The Inflation Reduction Act and the measures in it that provide subsidies for electrification, for adoption of EVs, for the use of solar panels, those types of sectors I uh, would get yet an, another push forward because I think that would be very much both kept intact and to one extent or another augmented. Remember, unlike, say, carbon taxes, um, uh, which would be really uh, sharply opposed by a Republican majority in the Senate, uh, subsidies for industry, subsidies for consumers are kind of things that politicians don't mind at all signing up to. After all, uh, consumers, their voters uh, enjoy getting a little money in their pocket when they buy an EV or they put solar panels on the roof for those sorts of things. So those are sectors that would be likely beneficiaries. Um, so too broadly would be industrials. Um, and I say that not because of tariffs. I mean, the Biden administration has continued many tariffs, particularly against China, but rather because there is actually a concerted effort um, through uh, infrastructure spending, which is only just beginning to pick up uh, to really begin to um, increase the demand for industrial goods, many of which will come from the United States, uh, quite literally earth moving equipment, if one wants to use a simple example. Um, so those are areas that would be beneficiaries. Before I, I, I leave it and maybe talk a bit about the Trump side of it, there probably are some sectors, though, that will not perform in terms of equity market performance. And those would be, again, fossil fuel industries um, and in particular energy within that space. Um, there is obviously a big shift in kind of a Biden world, a Biden-Harris world toward um, towards electrification and towards alternative energy sources. 
Uh, the second would be pharma. Um, I think there's a big, big push to try to streamline the American healthcare system. And one of the points where that can be done is by driving down the price of prescription drugs. Medicare using its power to do so is one such avenue, which is obviously uh, a challenge for pharma, uh, for the pharmaceuticals industry. Uh, and financial services maybe as well, uh, some increased oversight and regulation, but probably that comes third in that group. Yeah. Larry, how much of a political re risk premium being priced in at this stage, if the election is contested, uh, you know, and sh I guess the question is, should investors be fearing a U.S. political uncertainty scenario? Well, let me begin with the observation that I think uh, was first made by the historian Niall Ferguson. Uh, markets get many things right. They are machines to discount the future. But one thing they seem to get recurringly very, very wrong is big calamities. Um, uh, his work was about how markets failed to foresee both the arrival of World War I and its devastating consequences economically, financially, and otherwise. Um, and I, I think that's an analogy for today. We've seen a period of very, very robust uh, equity market performance led by the United States, led by the Magnificent Seven, but nevertheless, over the course of the last two years, uh, record highs of very high multiples compared to historic averages. Um, and we've seen a pretty robust bond market uh, as well for much of that period of time, particularly as inflation came down and a lot of stability, low volatility across most asset classes. So traditional measures of market risk are largely absent. Uh, traditional measures of market enthusiasm are everywhere to be seen. Um, and now we head into potentially a contested election, um, one where there might be some violence depending on which party wins, one where it's entirely possible that the outcome would be decided ultimately as it was in 2000 by the U.S. Supreme Court, but where in this case, the widespread perception uh, completely across the population is that the Supreme Court is no longer a, uh, let's say, a judicial arbiter uh, and an unbiased one, but rather has very strong political leanings, leanings uh, in its majority. Uh, and therefore, one has to question whether the outcome would be accepted, let's say, if they, if if like 2000, they decided in favor of, of the Republican candidate Trump, as they did George W. Bush in 2000, and against uh, the, the Democratic candidate, whether it would be so easily accepted as Al Gore so graciously did in 2000, despite disagreeing with the decision of the Supreme Court. So I think markets are underestimating what we may be up against over the next few months. Uh, and for that point of view, as I believe I said earlier, I, I anticipate actually some volatility following the election, um, and it could break either way, depending on, uh, it could happen irrespective of who looks to have won yeah. the election. Are we underestimating the potential effects, or are the markets, uh, you know, underestimating the potential effects on global economic growth forecasts based on the election outcome? There, I think it's a little harder to say, right? A, a period of prolonged volatility, perhaps some shakeout in global capital markets would obviously have some impact on economic activity. To argue otherwise would be, I think, rather rather foolish. But if the period of uncertainty and potential sort of market volatility is contained, then it need not have longer, longer term yeah, economic impacts. One of the things I think we should probably note is that from the global economy perspective, uh, leave aside politics, which is a little hard to do these days, uh, the U.S. economy is in pretty robust shape, uh, growing strongly uh, by all accounts, essentially fully employed, inflation falling back to target. But even beyond that, not many visible imbalances, household indebtedness relative to their income has come down dramatically from where it was 15 years or so ago. Corporate sector looks to be both highly profitable and not particularly leveraged. Yes, there's a big stock of public debt, but that's rarely the source of, let's say, a short term uh, issue. Uh, so from that perspective, the U.S. economy looks to be both balanced and, and, uh, and, 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 and strong, but also therefore robust. And finally, if we look globally, yes, Japan and uh, Western Europe are unable to stage their own recoveries, uh, such as it always has been. But China is now taking actions to try to improve its growth. So my, my sense here is that we're talking about political uncertainty. We're talking about sectoral uncertainty, winners and losers in terms of investments. 
across sectors depending on candidates, but we're not fundamentally right now debating the state of the world economy, which is if is either okay or good, depending where you look. Yeah, yeah. So before I let you go then, uh, Larry, do I dare ask, which way do you see this vote swinging? So I, I, I guess I do respect, let's say, where people are kind of putting their money in that sense. And so if you look at sort of the odds makers and the, and the, and the prices that follow those things, uh, they, 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 they show actually a gap that's opened up in the last now probably close to a month to five weeks for Donald Trump. Um, it is uh, the case, it seems to me, that the United States does lean to the right anyway. And, and I don't mean that in the popular vote. Popular vote does not. But obviously, the, the framers of the Constitution have set up a mechanism where a minority can have majority rule quite easily through the Electoral College. Uh, that's true in the Senate as well. And actually, because of the gerrymandered state of the House of Representatives, it's even becoming the case there. So I think all those factors um, tend to, to tilt things towards the Trump victory, or to put it differently, this election, in my view, was always Trump's to lose. Um, now, he might yet do so, right, because he has alienated uh, you know, significant parts of the U.S. population through his words and sometimes through his actions. Uh, but again, the, 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 the United States is, a, is an inherently, I think, deeply, fairly conservative country uh, and is typically going to go this way. It takes something to dissuade them from doing so. So uh, my prediction is that, that Donald Trump will be the next president of the United States. And on that note, Larry, we count down to the 5th of November and then, of course, the tallying of the votes and then the 16th of de de December, where we have this all certified. Larry Hathaway is co-founder of Jackson Hole Economics. Uh, so thank you so much for having joined us and for sharing your perspective with us today. Great. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. And to our viewers, remember, the series is free, it's shareable, it's available to anyone, whether you're a PSG client or not. Until next time, from me, Alicia Seckham, it's goodbye.